Well, our last speaker of the day is uh, Donnie Hay from IBM. And I actually feature this case study in the book, Metrics That Matter, because I think it's a wonderful case study on managing inventory and managing the channel. And if you think about the high-tech industry and the high turns and the obsolescence and the inventory, you know, how do we manage the channel and how do we build global supply chains? And this is a case study around how IBM built a network to be able to do that. So, Donnie, in the session with style. Thank <laughs> okay. you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, share with you our work as Steve and Manny talked to you about how they use analytics in Intel and Schneider yesterday. I want to share with you um, our transformation, how we've leveraged analytics in our supply chain and some of the lessons learned along with the case study of the IBM by analysis tool that Laura referenced and I'll close with how we would uh, wish to collaborate for the future. As uh, with most multinationals, we've gone through becoming a globally integrated enterprise and it moved on to being in our supply chain, a smarter supply chain, using advanced analytics and optimization, um, supply chain visibility, and multi-enterprise collaboration. We're moving from this phase into our new era where we're going to leverage uh, Watts-enabled enabled cognitive analytics, really pervasive supply chain transparency, data-driven processes, and enabled by cloud, mobile, and social. The supply chain within IBM has a broad uh, set of responsibilities. In, in addition to the traditional score model activities, we also have uh, teams that support all the sellers in IBM and our channel partners in their pre-sales work. So we prepare the quotations and the proposals for the engagements. And then we uh, take all the orders on the back end, we do all the billing, and we collect all the cash for the corporation. So this is, um, we've moved from really being a cost center to really a value center for the corporation. Along with all these activities, as you might admit, I believe there's a lot of data that gets collected. So for an engineer and a finance person like myself, a true geek, um, you know, it's fun to uh, leverage all this data. Um, how do we leverage this data then within the, in the company? From an analytics perspective, we start, you know, foundationally with descriptive analytics you know, uh, basic business intelligence, kind of what happened, right? Uh, the true advanced analytics comes in when we apply predictive analytics to that. So now that we know what happened, what do we think is going to, uh, what's happened, what do we think will happen next? Additionally, if you can uh, uh, provide prescriptive analytics, so now that we know what happened, what we think will happen in the future, how do we optimize the decisions in our process um, you have a real winner. Any, any application that you develop that combines descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive techniques can really bring value to the corporation. We try and embed the analytics that projects that we do into the daily operations of the business. The thing we're working on now is, again, cognitive. So not only leveraging structured data, but now unstructured data to develop even further um, op opportunities for bringing value to the corporation. It's very sensitive. Um, I mentioned that we have a broad set of responsibilities. We have over 30 analytics techniques um, and tools that we have leveraged across the quote to cash portion of, our, of all of our activities, as well as source to pay activities in the enterprise process framework. The application I'm going to talk to you in, in a minute about the IBM by analysis tool actually um, has several points of intersection in our process. As we developed these analytic solutions, we've uh, learned some very, very valuable lessons for us. There are three, thing, three key things 
that have really um, make a project work for us. First, there has to be a, a readiness to change by the operational teams. It's best to start with a business pain point. If everybody can rally around something that isn't working, right, then as you develop the model, there's, there's a readiness to, to improve it and to, to deploy it once you're done. So rally around a business pain point. We ensure that we have not only the analytics teams, but the, the operational team and the process transformation teams with us on any given project. We run a three in the box process. And as the project moves forward through various phases, the three executives that are responsible for, for the project will sit down and make sure they're still in sync on how that project is working. Some projects, like the one I'm gonna talk about in, in the next few minutes, requires even further sets of executive sponsorship. So sometimes, again, you have to get the general manager of a brand, the general manager of the channel, right? The CFO involved in to support what you're trying to do. So, but again, that rallying around a business pain point with readiness to change is core. Secondly, use an iterative approach. Start small, right? Build a model around an issue in one brand, in one geography. Get it to work there, which will take several iterations of the model, working again with your colleagues in the process transformation team and the operational teams, and improve the model. And then from there, you'll have a proof point, easy to, easier than to get business funding for the next step to, to go deploy across multiple brands or across multiple geographies. And finally, very, very important, incentive alignment. So uh, make sure if the tool you're developing is being used within your enterprise, that the operational teams that are supposed to use that tool have the right incentive to use it, right? They're being gonna be measured on using the tool. If in fact the tool you're going to be using is one that crosses multiple enterprises, make sure the terms and conditions of how your businesses work together and money flows between your businesses are aligned to support use of the tool. Again, very, very important piece. Don't wait for the end to bring in the incentive alignment. Now I'd like to talk about the IBM by analysis tool. We, we actually started this project probably about six years ago now. Um, problem statement was, for all practical purposes, we were not managing well the inventory that was with our distribution partners. We either, um, and we in most cases run a two-tier distribution model um, where we, the manufacturer, uh, ship to a dis tier one distributor who then is responsible for working with a, t a tier two reseller who sells to the end client. Issue, we had hundreds and thousands of SKUs out there and we either didn't have enough to, for of any one given part to uh, supply our client, end user clients, or we had too much. Uh, the challenges were the lack for the guys making the supply recommendations to the distribution channel. They had a lack of visibility to the data that was actually, the sales out data that was actually being provided from the distribution channel. And we really weren't in sending, providing great analytics behind it or great incentives behind how to optimize that. So in essence, we either had stockouts and not able to supply our clients or IBM and our distribution partners were spending a lot of money having it tied up in inventory that was sitting there, right? And in our industry where you have cost declines of you know, one to 5% a month, having, having inventory that isn't moving is very economically um, impactful. 
what did we do about it? We created a multi-enterprise channel collaboration tool. So we brought, uh, that brings data in from the distributors in terms of what they are selling out and what they have on hand. We took data from our own manufacturing systems and product systems, created a uh, advanced analytics tool that provides a forward-looking sales forecast at an SKU stocking level, and then created a prescriptive model that told the distributors what to buy at an individual SKU level every week. And we combined incentives around that in terms of terms and conditions um, to, to make using the tool um, attractive for everyone. To pull this off, we worked with the CFOs and the general managers of the IBM brands at these major distributors, right? Got their agreement again, because they were feeling the pain of this, um, of their current approaches. Uh, got their agreement to put this, you know, to pilot this on 100 part, 100 SKUs. And from there, um, expanded it to the entire portfolio. Um, as you can see, the financial benefits to both IBM and the di distributors were significant and, um, and allowed us to uh, really improve our serviceability to our end user clients and the relationship with the, with the distribution um, partners. Along the way, we ended up creating a demand signal repository. So all this good data went into one warehouse that again was helpful for not only the processes being worked, you know, in, in the inventory management, but also for, you know, the product development teams and everyone else to, to appreciate what was really going on out in the marketplace. How it works, again, we receive daily feeds from the distributors around the world on what they're selling out in their inventory positions. We pull from our own internal systems what we have, you know, ordered for them in manufacturing, in transit to them. Our model creates a forecast at an SKU level looking at variability of demand at a part number level. We generate a min-max buy recommendation, so set based on targeted fill rates. And then there's a process that's run each week where the folks at IBM that are responsible for working with the distributors and the distributor asset management teams get together, go through the data, and look at, at uh, the buy recommendations and decide what, what in essence is going to be ordered. Um, what we find is that probably the model itself can help with 90 to 95% of the SKUs. You know, but again, um, the, the reason the, the collaboration process is so important, the model doesn't know everything that salespeople know, right? So a distributor salesperson may know of a very large, you know, deal or bid that's in play for a particular end user client where, you know, the requirement for product is going to be greater than the model is recommending. We modified the process to take into consideration this, this collaboration. And if the collaboration, you know, so if in fact that particular deal is viewed strongly enough, we'll adjust then the buy recommendation, taking that into consideration. Um, the orders get placed, and then with that, the distributors and the IBMers know as, as long as they're taking and placing those buy recommendations at the appropriate levels, they know they're going to get something called price or, uh, the price protection. And so they know that as they're placing the orders as well. We've rolled this out across the United States, went to Europe next, where, again, you have lar larger numbers of distributors. We had to modify the application to support currencies. And 
uh, something called multi-country distribution. In Europe, by, you know, the, the purchasing decision can be taken in one country for distributor locations in many other countries. So we had to modify our models to take that complexity into consideration, but it's worked very well for us. Um, in the growth markets, we've done the classic um, IBAT deployment in China and Russia. Uh, for the growth markets um, in uh, Brazil and India and Mexico, they tend to the channel isn't, uh, doesn't hold as much inventory, so what we tend to, as IBM, hold the finished goods. So we actually took and modified the model for our own internal use in terms of our own finished good Kanbans. I mentioned alignment of incentives and the importance of terms and conditions here. And in this industry, there's something called uh, price protection. As the manufacturer in the electronics industry um, it may have shipped goods to a distributor, title has passed, but the manufacturer still has you know, economic responsibility if, in fact, the manufacturer takes and reduces price for that product that's in a distribution channel. Heretofore, terms of that price protection were 30 days. So if we we would provide price protection if, in fact, we had shipped the part, you know, less than 30 days before. Um, sometimes, you know, for more complex product, uh, 45 to 60 days, but typically it was around 30 days. What we, we did is we created something called qualified price protection, and we told the distributors that if they ordered to up to the max recommended supply line that our model suggested every week, we would provide them price protection irrespective of when they had ordered the part. So we didn't care if it was 30 days, we didn't care if it was 45 days. We believed that this was gonna help us manage our inventory um, so much better, again, at an SKU level, that we would give them qualified price protection as long as they were, they were going within the model um, max levels. Um, the other thing that we did was, again, we provided that report to them so they knew every week where they were going to be on price protection if we, took, if we took an action. And we also automated the feed of that calculation. So when, in fact, we did take price, we automated the calculation of that and sent it to our fulfillment teams that actually were responsible for dispersing those, that cash to the distribution. So we tried to, again, make this as easy and integrated and touchless as possible end to end for us and our partners. Uh, this is just an example of the dashboard. Again, what's, what's important here is this is a dashboard, has the same data, you know, so a distributor, asset management person, and an IBM are, is, are looking at the same data every day, <laughs> that's, that's huge, right? Just so everybody, you know, says, okay, here's the numbers, guys, right? Um, along with this, in addition to the information on what was selling out, the forecasts of what was going to sell out, you know, how much was on hand, how much was on order, how much was in transit, we also were able to then, this became uh, an important platform for the teams. So we put other information on relative to the product life cycle, if the product was new in its, in its life cycle or was going to be going end of life, et cetera. Um, we gave them alerts as to whether they should be buying more or if, in fact, they needed to be improving sale, sales as well. Uh, the information is... Again, it's in a collaborative plat online platform. However, data can be pulled down to uh, work in spreadsheets, you know, for other reporting purposes as well. Um, so it's always um, it's it's always very rewarding to work on and develop a project that actually provides a financial benefits to your company and, and your partner companies. Um, what's neat, too, is when your, your partners, this becomes a platform for them to do their business, 
and they take what you've developed and make and integrate it into their daily processes. So it's um, it's been uh, very beneficial for us and our partners, and and the quotes are. Um, um, make the long days and uh, <laughs> angst very much worthwhile. Um, stepping back, how we like to collaborate in the future, again, uh, we're an internal um, analytics team within the integrated supply chain. We do a lot of work externally uh, with our our sales colleagues going out to talk to clients. We're not on commission, so we can come in as practitioners and, and you know, just kind of share lessons learned and thoughts. Um, so we, we do a lot of work with our client-facing organizations in IBM. We also try and do a lot of work with, again, industry forums and universities um, around the world. Uh, again, just sharing for students studying analytics how they can be used in, you know, in industry and also, you know, uh, learning from them. We found that uh, very invigorating. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with all of you. And again, um, so you have Imagine Man over there. We have, we call her future supply chain lady. Um, so, uh, so we, we, um, we view the future as even more about, um, we think transparency and ex an extended multi-enterprise supply chain leveraging big data and analytics will be, uh, very, very key to our future. So, um, anyway, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, share our work. Thank you, Donnie. You know, one of the things I love about this case study is that sales is so used to selling volume, right? Yeah. And they want to sell into the channel, and you had to manage this inventory in the channel. Tell me about the behavior of the sales organization and the rollout of the different geographies around the world. Uh, yes, so that was that was an interesting um, interesting challenge. So and and probably the reason I met I mentioned early on that I had to have the general manager of the brand, <laughs> the CFO of the brand, and the general manager of the channel organization with me, because you know heretofore um, the sales guys had been used to just you know, telling the jan channel to buy what, what they thought best, right? And, but there wasn't really a lot of data behind it. So you were bringing data to the fore. And again, you know, bringing terms and conditions. So the channel teams, and particularly the CFO, the channel teams were very, very interested in what my buy recommendations were and were their, their teams following those, right? Because again, when you align incentives and money's changing hands, you know, um, there's, there's tremendous power in that. So we had to work a lot with the sales teams. And I think the more forward thinking sales teams kind of got it. Again, that demand signal repository and the data that was there was, could really help them do their jobs, right? To, to see what was, what was moving, what was hot, what they should be focusing on, where in a particular, uh, a country, you know, this product wasn't work, moving as well as it was in another country. Why was that, et cetera? So the more forward thinking um, took advantage of the power of the data and the tool to do their jobs better. Um, some of the teams, you know, escalated me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and I just go see the general manager right. and, and say, you know, here's, here's the deal, right? Um, you know, and again, that collaboration, I mentioned the collaboration process, the weekly process was important because, again, you know, um, I think there was a lot of fear initially that, you know, well, we're letting this model take over everything, right? That wasn't the case at all, right? You want, you want the model to take over 90 to 95 percent of the recommendations where Humans, there isn't enough brain power to go through and appreciate what should be ordered for all those anyway. Where you want the sales guys to bring in the information is where is there a hot deal that is for which we're going to need more supply, right? Bring that in. Let you know. Let's talk it through, and then and then we'll make the modification, right? So again, as long as we were willing to, you know, and it took time. <laughs> Some, some longer than others, but you know, if you're willing to work with them, talk it through, 
um, and collaborate, um, you know, we found we, we eventually got there. So. so what was the impetus, right? This was a big change for you, and it yes. took a long time. What was the spark? What was the impetus? So I was actually in a different role at the time in the brand, and, I, um, and uh, we were, again, we were having financial issues. We were having supply chain issues. So we had two huge pain points, right? And again, when you, you know, and, and our partners weren't making money either, right? So, um, so I think, so it was, it was the pain point identified before. And then, you know, I knew there was this data that was out there coming in from the partners that was being used to pay, you know, promotions, okay? That we that the supply chain wasn't you and the brand wasn't using, right? And it just seemed it, it seemed you know Wrong. not yeah not smart not to use yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so I talked to a few guys that were more forward thinking in the channel organization and said, and uh, and some of my colleagues in IBM Research and said, what if? What if we could develop this model that used this data smartly and we gave it to you guys and, and uh, kind of the idea took off from there. So it was really, you know, pain point and maybe knowing that some information was available that we didn't think before that could, could help us make it work. Questions? Question up here if we want to run the mic and we got a question in the back uh, with CJ. So maybe Heather, you could go to see CJ and Abby can come up here. You know, it's a wonderful case study because a lot of times people talk about collaboration, but without a data-driven analytics mm -hmm. approach, it's hard to really get that alignment, right? right? Yes. You know, yes. And yeah. So that's what we see. Go ahead. Uh, Laura Asiella from Pixar Global. Thank you, Danny. I'm just going to follow up again because you emphasized, you know, I, I wrote down this quote that you had um, about as critical as math and analytics expertise are transformation leadership and operations expertise is even more important. So yes. I'd really appreciate a little bit more insight into what you consider to be transformational leadership and what are some of the things that you're working on developing with the people in your supply chain? So, so transformational leadership to me is, again, just recognizing that with, you know, an advanced analytics model, you can really um, provide predictive, but that prescriptive insight into making and optimizing a process. And then working, you know, this just doesn't happen overnight, right? So working, you know, going through that iterative process, right? Tweaking the model, where does it work well? Where doesn't it work well? How do, can we modify the algorithms or do we have to just, you know, create different classifications of, you know, this type of, of um, transactions is going to flow through, this type of transaction we'll have to do a bit more work on or something to, you know, so it's really just thinking cr creatively about how to, how to use, you know, tool, mathematical tools and the data and the prescriptive analytics from them and then embed them into a process and drive that change around the globe. Um, and make sure you got that incentive alignment, make sure you got the executive sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and that's, it's, it's, that can be hard. It's very rewarding when you make it happen, right? And you solve the pain point. It's very rewarding. But, you know, can, but to me that's, that's really, driving transformation and change. So, Donnie, you know, when I look at this case study, it took you seven years to roll this out across the globe, right? Well, it took us, it probably took us four. Okay. It, it really took us four. It's, it's been in steady state now, but, you know. Okay. Um, and again, the other cool thing is once you, um, you know, once you kind of get a model going, right, so then, like I showed you for India and um, Brazil and Mexico, where the channel, you know, isn't as you know, financial, you know, doesn't have as much financial backing, so IBM tends to hold the finished goods. We took, we said, well, the logic we're using, you know, and I bet for the channel will work for us, you know, sales mm -hmm. out, we'll just be our ship, you know, we'll just, 
you know, use different data, but the same, the same basic concepts of the model work. So then you figure out there's derivatives of, of the model, right? So you get the core working, and then you figure out, oh my goodness, with a little tweak here, I can use it here, and then with a little tweak here, I can use it here, and, you know, and, and so that, that becomes cool too to see, you know, it's, it's spark uses that you ri didn't originally intend other, other places. Um, so that, that makes it fun. So, yeah. But, but, you know, to her question around transformational yeah. leadership, right? I mean, this is really an end to end kind of yes. outside end view. And most companies that are in a very vertical silo would have thrown this baby out with the bathwater, right? You know, I, I think that they wouldn't have had the courage to keep going and to her point around transformational leadership. Yeah, yeah. It really, you know, you have to believe in it. And I was fortunate that I had general managers that believed in what I was trying to do and would fund what I was trying to do and support me when, you know, the sales guys came <laughs> and said maybe, you know, they weren't. So, you know, you, you, um, um, you have to have, you have to you, courage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Courage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, CJ, last question of the uh, conference. Make it a good one. Make okay. it sing. <laughs> I'm always very pragmatic. So my, my question is around uh, your methodology, your journey on, on the data. You're pulling from channels, from CMs, from manufacturers and stuff, and it's, it's bad in some cases, missing and consistent. Yeah. Um, and that affects your ability to do into an analytics. So can you talk, talk about your journey of how you got the data to a clean state, how you chose what data to fix first, or you know, just the methodology you used in that process? Uh, certainly. So, uh, I, th I think there's a um, there's a lot of focus on is the data, you know, oh my data isn't good. Well, typically what I find is the data is good enough. Point one, to start going, right? Um, you know, the, um, if you find it's truly bad, then okay, you're kind of dead in the water. But what we found was the data was good enough to get the model working. Um, the second very key thing that I have found is when people understand that you're actually using their data, doing analytics with it, and now prescriptive decisions are being recommended based on partially on their data, the data gets better. <laughs> <laughs> right? So a lot of the, so the distributors were sending, you know, sending us all this data every day. And, you know, again, people were using it for certain purposes, but they really maybe weren't exercising it like this model exercises it, right? So, you know, I, a lot of them, when they realized how we were going to use it and the implications thereof, you know, I think they took extra steps to make their data a little better as well. So, um, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Get started, get going with it. And then once people understand, I think the data tends to get better. Right? I think that's really key. I see a lot of people like, oh, wait till my data gets perfect, right? Yeah, if you don't yeah. use your data, it's never going to get better. Right, right. right. And, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. And that's what analytics help us do. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great presentation. <laughs>